Welcome back, everyone, to a new reaction series. This is one people have asked for for a long time. We're going to be diving into Catherine the Great today. I just got back from a fantastic weekend uh, in Washington, D.C. at Arlington National Cemetery and then a couple of days in Gettysburg, where I got to spend quite a bit of time with my friend Gary Edelman from the American Battlefield Trust. You'll be seeing some of my tour with him of the battlefield. Uh, in the coming weeks with that new series. I've got a couple of videos to get finished up uh, for the Vicksburg series, and then we're going to dive right into Gettysburg. And then after that, we will do the uh, Arlington National Cemetery videos. A lot of great content. I'm excited to share with you. Uh, but we're going to get to that as soon as possible. Today, Catherine the Great. So, I don't know a ton about Catherine the Great. I do know she is the ancestor of pretty much every royal family uh, in Europe today. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom is not an, a descendant of Catherine the Great, but her husband was, which means Prince Charles, Prince William, and on and on. So starting with uh, Prince Charles, the royal family, uh, the monarchs of the UK will be descendants of Catherine the Great. I know the King of Spain is a descendant of Catherine the Great, uh, the Queen of the Netherlands, uh, I think the King of uh, Sweden. Uh, basically all of them. So uh, excited to dive into her story. Let's take a look. A young girl sits alone in a cold room in a great house on the German coast and dreams of being a queen. That girl's name was Sophia, or Sophie, depending on who's writing about her. She was born in the spring of 1729, but her mother would never forgive her for the crime of being a girl. Her mother, young, ambitious, always wanting to be the center of attention, was deeply discontent in her life, having been married off at 15 to a man 21 years her senior. Worse still, that man was poor, at least by her standards, mm. and stuffy. Her life was nothing like the glittering court that she'd known as a girl. She still had ambition. She still wanted to escape her husband's drab military post, to live in high society and see the world. And to her mind, that required a male heir. And so, poor Sophia was neglected, often told that she was ugly, yelled at for minor offenses, or simply left entirely alone. And this is all important because, and you know, my wife being a school counselor, we spent a lot of time talking about kind of the mental aspect of things and how people are raised and how that impacts their lives. And Boy, I mean, there's so many times you can look at things. Uh, in some of these uh, very consequential people in history, look at their upbringing and see how that affected the person that they became. Uh, and you can already see kind of who Catherine the Great is uh, later in life uh, being affected by the way she's treated as a child and how that causes her to become the person she is. She was bright and could memorize things with ease, but she frequently infuriated her tutors by asking questions like, why were the great men of antiquity damned just because they lived before Christ? Or, what was the universe like before creation? She found solace only in the lessons she was taught by one of her governesses, who introduced her to French and brought her books by Racine and Moliere. And all the while, her mother doted on her sickly and infirm brother, who'd been born a year and a half after she'd entered the world, unwanted. Sophia would always harbor a resentment over the treatment she received compared to her brother, but in 1742, when she was 13, her brother died, succumbing to scarlet fever. She had one other brother who would survive their youth, but he was a half-decade younger, and so now, at last, her ambitious mother's eye finally turned to her. But she didn't receive the warmth and the affection that she'd hoped for. Her mother's aim was to see her married. After all, her... Honestly, I mean... Let's face it, if you're a woman, especially a woman born into an important family, that's how you're viewed. Uh, it's all about what kind of a marriage can we make for you. Um, you know, there's not really any level of control over your own life. Of course, we know that Catherine will exert that control in her own life in, in ways that most women uh, in her situation never do. And I want to mention something too. You know, obviously we're, we're calling her Sophia here because that's the name she had grown up. This is a really, really common thing with uh, people who become royalty uh, is that the name that they go by isn't necessarily their regnal name. Um, a perfect example would be Queen Victoria. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria. Uh, so Victoria was kind of her middle name. 
Um, most of the royal family members, like in the UK now, have like four first names, and they could use any one of them if they wanted to. King George the Sixth was Albert, Bertie, he was called. His brother Edward the Eighth was David. Uh, her mother thought taking her daughter out in search of a match to travel and get back to court might provide a path to escape her drab life. Unfortunately, her daughter was proud, impertinent, and arrogant, or at least so she felt. If there was to be any attempt at matchmaking, she was going to have to break Sophia of these habits. And so, Sophia learned to hide her pride, to hide her talents, and her mother began writing and visiting all of their relatives in search of a match. And she made sure that Sophia knew just what failing to find a match would mean. From time to time, she would take Sophia to see spinster relatives locked away in a convent. Oh my god. Or this is your future if you don't get married to someone really good. It's a it's a small miracle that that she ends up sane at all with this kind of a mother. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a good comparison, but most of the mothers that I think of are from fictional stories rather than in history. Shut away in a remote wing of a family house. One of these encounters, Sophia would remember forever. An aunt who lived in one small room with 16 pug dogs. 16 pugs who did everything that dogs... She, she was the crazy cat lady, only instead of cats, they were pugs. That's awesome. ...do in that one room. The smell would haunt her for all her days. Hmm. So she rapidly became enamored of the idea of marriage. She saw it as a way out, an escape from her mother. But her prospects were limited. Her father was not a man of great means, and though he was a prince of one of the tiny principalities that then made up the Holy Roman Empire, he wasn't even the prince of that domain, having others in the line of succession before him. All right, so let's talk about her father for just a minute here. So one thing I will say about uh, Christian August is uh, if you if you go back really far in his family tree, I'm talking like 10, 12, 14 generations, you don't find any... Uh, you know, kings or queens, which is typical for these people who end up in royalty, is that you go back within three or four generations, you usually find some king or queen or some monarch of some kind. You don't find that with Christian. But to, to say that he was kind of a minor nobody, uh, I think is a little disingenuous. Uh, he was a, a field marshal, a, a general field marshal who was made by uh, King Frederick II of Prussia. Uh, so he was highly trusted by the King of Prussia. Uh, and so he did have uh, some influence because of his performance in war. Um, but he was a pretty minor noble in terms of his birth and his standing in that way. And he did have this co-monarch, uh, John Louis II, who was also a prince of Anhalt. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty impressive when you think about it. Uh, to end up the Empress of Russia, to end up married off to the Emperor of Russia with the pedigree that she has is really quite impressive. Her mother, on the other hand, was of the House Holstein Gottorp, one of the great houses of the Holy Roman Empire. And though she was from a minor branch, she could still reach out to all her cousins. And so it was that, even before her brother died, on a visit to her uncle, Sophia met the orphaned Duke of Holstein, Peter Ulrich, 11 years old at the time. This young man was the heir to the throne of Sweden, and the last surviving grandson of Peter the Great. He was also sickly, though, doughy of features, and even at the age of 11... Doughy of features. That's such a... Oh, what a horrible thing to have to say about a person. ...than given to drink. This meeting would prove fortuitous in years to come, or disastrous depending on how you look at it. But long before that chance encounter was to change her life, as she was making the rounds looking for a suitor, attention of this type fell on her much closer to home. At the age of 14, a 24-year-old cuirassier, her cousin, began to, what was called at the time, show his affections, often finding her in some secluded corner of the house when no one else was around to kiss her. He eventually... You know, there's another story similar to this. It comes from English history, and it concerns uh, the future Queen Elizabeth I. She, um, so long story short, Henry VIII, we know he was married six times. Queen Elizabeth I is his daughter through Anne Boleyn, who he had beheaded uh, and was basically disinherited and all that. Um, after Anne Boleyn, he marries Jane Seymour. Well, uh, Jane Seymour's brother, Thomas, was put into some... Uh, two of her brothers, Edward and Thomas, were both given a lot of authority. And Thomas ended up marrying the widow 
of Henry VIII, his last uh, wife, Catherine Parr. Thomas marries her, and they basically have responsibility for Elizabeth. And Thomas kind of groomed Elizabeth, I guess you could say. And as an early teen, uh, he really was kind of putting the moves on her. He had an eye for her. And we don't really know exactly how far that all went, but similar kind of situation to this. He proposed to her, although she expertly put him off by agreeing to it only if he could get the consent of her parents. Then, in the middle of dinner one night, a letter came. It was from Russia, from the Russian Empress Elizabeth. Elizabeth, whose sister had married a Holstein. She's a Holstein-in-law. That's awesome. Elizabeth, who was the aunt of Peter Ulrich. Elizabeth, who had been betrothed at one point to Sophia's uncle. Elizabeth, whose association Sophia's mother had been very careful to cultivate. Networking works, guys. And this is why someone who isn't real high on the list of suitable matches you know she's not like really high ranking in terms of oh man she's got like you know i'll give you an example of what i mean by this so when you look at the family tree of someone like uh prince philip the duke of edinburgh the uh recently passed um husband of queen elizabeth ii uh, and it might be kind of hard for you guys to see on this i'll i i, I guess i can zoom in when i'm editing um you know, look at his family tree. Uh, on his father's side, he's descended from Christian the Ninth of Denmark. Uh, he's descended from his, you know, so that's his great grandfather is King Christian the Ninth of Denmark. His grandfather is King George the First of Greece. Uh, on his dad's mother's side, his great grandfather is Grand Duke Constantine of Russia. And if you go back further on that line, uh, another generation, he's he's the son of. Tsar Nicholas II. So Prince Philip is descended from Christian the Ninth of Denmark. He's descended from the Tsars of Russia. Uh, on this side, um, he's descended from the Grand Duke of Hesse. Uh, and uh, you got Tsars on that side. And then over here, royal family. So all of his lines are high-ranking royals. That's the kind of match you typically see for an heir to the throne. So someone like... Uh, the, the future czar of Russia should have this kind of pedigree in a spouse, but he doesn't. Regularly sending her news and portraits of her daughter, Elizabeth had recently become the guardian of young Peter Ulrich, adopting him as her own. And as such, young Peter had lost the right to the crown of Sweden, but had gained a much greater prize, succession to the crown of Russia. Elizabeth's letter said nothing of its purpose, but simply implored Sophia and her mother to travel at once to Russia. Despite the letter's vagueness, the implications were clear. Sophia might yet find her way to being a queen, as she had so often daydreamed. But the night's surprises weren't over yet. Mere hours after the first letter's arrival, a second courier, breathless Morning, and ma'am. panting, burst into the house. He too had a letter, but this one was from Frederick the Great, summoning them to his court in Berlin. Sophia's mother wasted no time starting to pack. The so remember, like I said, um, you know, Sophia, Catherine's father, uh, is a general field marshal uh, for the king of Prussia. And so um, this family's well known uh, to the royal family of Prussia. The invitation to Russia had come with a banknote for 10,000 rubles to equip them for their journey. This, of course, Hope went that's enough. not to making sure that Sophia looked like a bride that they had both hoped she would be, but instead went towards outfitting her mother with a splendid array of court dresses. And so they began their uh. journey, first to Berlin and then to Moscow. When they arrived at Berlin, Sophia's mother raced to present herself to Frederick, but to her shock, he simply asked where her daughter was. She hadn't taken Sophia with her to court, thinking that the king couldn't possibly want to talk to the girl more than to her incredible self. So she said that Sophia was sick. The next day, too, she showed up at court alone, and again Frederick asked where Sophia was, and again her mother said that she was sick. On the third day, Frederick pressed the issue, and Sophia's mother said that she couldn't come because she had nothing to wear. At which All right, I want to pause for a second because I want to check on something. So, so what I was looking up was uh, it, I got a little distracted when they said something about them going to Moscow. 
Um, because I was thinking, well, wait a second, wasn't St. Petersburg the capital by that point? And isn't that where they would have gone to meet with the royal family in Russia? Um, so St. Petersburg, you know, we talked about this in the in the Great Northern War series, uh, is founded as the new capital of Russia. And from 1718 to, or 1713 to 1918, I think it is, it's the capital of Russia, except for this little period from 1728 to 1730, where Moscow, again, is the capital. Um but I'm guessing that isn't when this is happening, but I guess it depends on the time period we're talking about and whether or not they would have gone to St. Petersburg. It doesn't, you know, just because it was the capital doesn't mean that's where they had to meet. So maybe somebody can fill me in on that that knows a little bit more about this topic than I do. At which juncture, a somewhat miffed Frederick the Great cut her off and asked one of his sisters to just lend the poor girl a dress, please. <laughs> Finally, Sophia appeared before the king in an ill-fitting dress without jewels or finery. She was shy, worried about what this great man might think. But to her surprise, and undoubtedly the surprise of her mother, she was seated at dinner that night right next to the king. Her mother wasn't even seated at the same table. <laughs> Stick it to mom. I love it. She's doing all the scheming behind the scenes, and yet she gets kind of pushed to the side. He knows where to go. The king tried to make her feel comfortable, speaking to her of poetry and of the opera, plays and ballet. And though everybody stared at the king talking to a child, he continued on and she opened up, speaking to him throughout the meal. By the end, he saw in her, hidden just below that layer of humility, an intelligence and a perception. Mm. He wrote to Elizabeth of Russia to say as much. He had been assessing her, because in his bid to make Prussia a player on the world stage, he had already created many enemies, and he knew that he would have to have Russia on his side. Mm -hmm. It was his hope that this German princess could help ensure that. But his business was not just with Sophia. In private, his agents asked her mother to be their agent in the Russian <laughs> court. They explained how one Count Bestashev was the sworn enemy of Prussia, and that he would stop Sophia's marriage if he could. And so Sophia's mother, Johanna, should do everything in her power to make him lose favor. So there's all this scheming, all this networking going on behind the scenes. It's all politics. And boy, it's it's really just, it sets the stage for a perfect kind of TV show, right? Which I think there is one right now called The Great, about Catherine the Great, which I'm probably going to have to watch uh, in conjunction with this series. Never again would these two rulers huh. meet in person. These rulers whom history titles the Great. But it's far from the last time that their paths will cross. Join us next time as Sophia finally makes her way to Russia, and her mother sets about trying to destroy Count Bestashev. And boy, you know, moms are always kind of lurking behind the scenes. Victoria's mom, Queen Victoria's mom, was the same way. She kind of tried to control things, but that only works until... The person you're trying to control figures out how much power they really have. And then once they figure that out and they start to wield it, pretty soon you can find yourself on the opposite end of things. But, you know, I mean, obviously Catherine the Great's got a fantastic story. I was sitting here racking my brain trying to think, is there another woman ruler in history who's known as the Great? I can't think of any off the top of my head. Maybe you guys can think of one. There are very few that are known as the Great. You know, in England, you've got Alfred the Great. Uh, in the rest of Europe, you've got Frederick the Great, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Alexander the Great in ancient times, um, Pompey the Great, Charlemagne, there's not a lot of them out there. Any other women? Somebody tell me if you can think of one. I'm excited. We're going to continue this series every day until it's done. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. And we will see you again tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks for watching. Welcome back, everyone, to episode two of my reaction series to Extra History's Catherine the Great. If you didn't see yesterday's episode one, there's a link in the description below, as well as the link to the original content creator. I encourage you to support them and everything that they do. Uh, also, I am back to making daily content on my gaming channel. Link is in the description for that. I did my first episode of a new series on Grand Tactician the Civil War as the Union. So if you're interested in such things, check that out. Let's go ahead and dive right into part two. Two carriages strain against the muck and mud of the Eastern European plains. Inside, a girl and her mother sit, traveling incognito, under assumed names. Each day takes them closer to Russia. Each day takes them closer to destiny.
For the first time in her life, Sofia was celebrated as someone special. Upon her arrival in Russia, the local fort fired its guns in her honor. People whispered of her presence as her sleighs chased the court from the Winter Palace to Moscow. When they caught up with Elizabeth's court, they were greeted by ministers, and then, to Sophia's delight, Peter himself. His fish-like appearance, nervous disposition, and his tendency to babble had not abated <laughs> at all since they met when she was ten, but he was enthusiastic to see her, and her heart soared at the prospect of such a regal match. Then they were led in to see the Empress. Sophia was overwhelmed by the dazzling splendor. Never in her life had she seen such majesty. And so the ensuing days passed with her at Peter's side. And with each passing day, she learned a little bit more about how boorish and unconcerned with his position Peter was. He told her about how much he loathed Russia. He barely even spoke the language, instead preferring German in all things. He hated the culture and the religion. Pla so isn't this interesting, and this is something that happens throughout history, where you've got a German and potentially a German. She was born in what today would be Poland, but she was German. Um, you have Germans, if they marry, who are going to inherit the throne of Russia. Well, this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, you know, the, the British royal family is very much German, uh, going all the way back to, I mean, first they were French with William the Conqueror. He was French uh, when the Normans take over. The Anglo-Saxons before them, the Saxons were German. Um, and then you have the, the Plantagenets, who are French. Uh, they were the Angevin dynasty, is what they were known at the time, which was from Anjou in France. So they were French. And then you get the German uh, dynasty of Hanover, where George I and George II, both of them, their first language was German. And then when Queen Victoria, who is part of this Hanover dynasty, she marries a German. And so their children are very much German. And so it's been kind of that way. The, the, you know, many of these royal families aren't what they were. The House of Bourbon, which ruled France, the heir to that throne today is Spanish. Um, you know, so it's a very common thing. Planned to remain a Lutheran. He even told her that he did not love her, and rather was in love with someone else, but was resigned to marry her because his aunt wished it. Meanwhile, Sophia began to realize that it wasn't Peter she had to please, but rather the Empress, Elizabeth. And not only that, but Peter isn't really going to be a match for her as far as like, you know, Sophia, a.k.a. Catherine the Great, she's concerned with power and influence. She's not necessarily quite as concerned about having a great husband, uh, which is why their marriage isn't going to last very long in terms of him being on the throne. Because uh, she sees the opportunity here. Uh, I don't know if this is something that happened right away or if it's something she only saw after she got into power and in position to take power, but uh, she obviously did pretty quickly. She took rapidly to her study of Russian and the Russian Orthodox faith. This pleased Elizabeth, but Sophia took to her studies almost too much, staying up late at night in the harsh Russian cold to continue her practice. Soon she fell ill. Elizabeth herself rushed to nurse her, but it was pneumonia. Mm. Not many survived that fatal. disease in those days, and her recovery was made all the more difficult by the doctor's insistence on bloodletting. For weeks she lay at death's door, but as the sickness burned through her, rumor of how she contracted the disease spread. Her love of Russia, for that's how everyone uh. perceived her ardent studies, was... And so then the question becomes, how much of this is legit and how much of this is propaganda? Look at how, how much this German girl is embracing our culture. She wants to be one of us. She loves it. She loves us more than the heir to the throne loves us. So already uh, there's this salesman job going on to sell people on Sophia made known, and she became beloved, even as she slipped in and out of consciousness. Slick. Then came a moment where everyone thought it was the end. Her mother requested a Lutheran priest, but Sophia, with what little Russian. strength was in her, Orthodox. asked for an Orthodox priest instead. Oh, and she, she knows how to play the game. Now, I'm not saying that this wasn't serious to her, and that she didn't mean it, but man, either way, she knew how to play the game. ...of this washed throughout the land. But even as Sophia's esteem was rising, her mother's came crashing down. Shortly after Sophia recovered, a series of letters that Johanna, Sophia's mother, had sent were intercepted. The king of Prussia had asked her to help him displace the Russian diplomat Bestashev at the last episode, court, and at this she failed spectacularly. 
vastly underestimating her opponent, she got caught sloppily speaking ill of him, the queen, and Russia. Elizabeth's ire was in... You can't do that before the marriage. I mean, at least wait until after they're married and, and everything is sealed and give it a little bit of time before you start this. Tense. And Sophia sat within the blast radius. A courier yep. burst in on Sophia and Peter while they were playing and told Sophia that she was to pack, that she was to be sent away immediately. While they were playing. Let's talk about this for a second, about how old they are at this point. So the attack of pneumonia and all this stuff happens in 1744. So this would be when Sophie or Sophia uh, is 15 years old. Uh, and they're married in 1745 when she's 16. But it's another 17 years after that before they come to the throne of Russia. Luckily, before her exile, she managed to get a moment with Elizabeth and humble herself before her. Elizabeth's fury abated, the game. and she decided Knows that how. the child could still marry her nephew. She even allowed Sophia's mother to stay, although her standing at court was greatly diminished. Elizabeth even accelerated things, pushing forward Sophia's formal conversion to Russian Orthodoxy so that the official betrothal could take place. But at the dinner after the betrothal, Johanna exploded in an outburst Ugh. when she was not seated at the table reserved for royalty. Somebody do something about this mom. She is wrecking everything. Saying that she would not be seated with mere ladies of the court. Elizabeth obliged her and sat her in a totally separate room by herself. <laughs> <With Sophia Co> <laughs> yes, that's how you handle it. You don't play her game. You don't give in to her temper tantrum. You punish her for it. I love it. That's great. I like Elizabeth a lot. Conversion to orthodoxy came a new name. She was rechristened Ekaterina. Ekaterina. Or as we know her in English, Catherine. After this, Catherine spent her days in the royal life, dancing, attending court, going to balls, simply counting down the days until the wedding. But then tragedy struck. Peter was laid low with smallpox. Catherine waited nervously for news. Eventually, Peter recovered, but he was disfigured. His already betrachean features now marred by the scars of the disease. Mm. The first time Catherine looked upon him, she was horrified. But the illness also stirred a resolve in the Empress Elizabeth. The realm needed an heir. There was no time to wait. No time to risk Get some married. other. All right, I know he's ugly now. He was ugly before, but now he's really ugly. Hurry up and get married, you 16-year-old. We need kids. Horrible malady. And so, Catherine and Peter were married. The affair was grand, full of splendor. Catherine's dress was of the finest make, and she was decked out with jewels. All of the highest and most notable members of the court were there. There was dancing and revelry, and then, at last, the ladies of the court escorted her to her bedchamber. There, not knowing what to do, she waited, alone. And she waited. And waited. Two hours later, Peter showed up, reeking of alcohol, and crashed onto the bed, passing out in an instant. At last, her marriage had freed her from her mother, but now- Do you know who's, what relationship this m reminds me of? It reminds me of um, Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, who we know famously from um, the time period of her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, uh, is married briefly to the King of France, but then he dies. And so then eventually she comes back to Scotland to reign uh, as the queen. And she ends up marrying this guy, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, who basically from the moment they get married, she hates him uh, and probably has him murdered. Um, and it, it reminds me a lot of that relationship. Now Catherine had a new humiliation and torment. Her husband showed no affection for her and spent all of his days playing buffoonish children's games. I, so I love this. Uh, if you ever go to um, Plymouth Plantation, I think it's called Pawtuxet Plantation now, um, in, uh, in Massachusetts where Plymouth Rock is, that whole thing, uh, they have kind of a living history place there. And eventually I've got a video that'll go up uh, about that, my visit to that. I just haven't had a chance to edit it yet. Um, that's one of the games they play is that thing with the wheel and you have to hit, like you have the stick where you have to try and keep it going. It's a lot harder than you think. My kids were better at it than I was. Days playing buffoonish children's games, making his servants dress up like soldiers and march around his room. Even when Peter was eventually made to give up such things and sleep in the same room as his wife, rather than be with her, he would wait until dark when their governess was gone and then take out his toy soldiers wow. and have one of the maids move them across the bed as he ordered them about. This continued for seven years. 
Then Catherine met a rakish young nobleman, far more knowledgeable in the ways of love than she. At first she resisted his advances, but eventually she gave in. Soon after, she was pregnant. She suffered through two horrible miscarriages, and then, finally, a son was born. Paul. Whispers abounded as to the son's actual parentage, and though in both looks and temperament he seemed Peter's son, and not any of the young lovers Catherine had taken, the matter would never be settled conclusively. But that didn't really matter, for as far as anyone official was concerned, Russia now had an heir. And so life moved apace, with Peter and Catherine living separate lives with separate loves, with their little court outside the halls of power. Then Elizabeth died. Mm. All of a sudden, Peter was made emperor, and life changed. Now this is, it, it seems like a short amount of time based on how they're telling the story, but it's 17 years, I think. Uh, it's 1745 when they get married. It's 1762 uh, when... Peter comes to the throne. In Not 1762, there very long. Oh. he took the throne, and one of his first orders was to reverse his aunt's military policies. For years, Russia had struggled in the Seven Years' War, that same war that kicked off the American Revolution and... Yeah, so good point here. Let's talk about what's happening in the rest of the world. 1762 is the end of the uh, French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War. This is when you're going to start seeing the build-up to the American Revolution. We are very close to the start of the French Revolution. We're about 40 years away, well, 30, 35 years away from the Napoleonic Wars kind of getting started. Uh, this is a major, majorly consequential time in world history. Through doing so, eventually led to Bolivar. Russia had exhausted innumerable men and material trying to break the might of Prussian arms. After so many years of fighting, they were on the verge of success. Prussia was nearing utter collapse. Berlin itself was on the verge of falling. And, and the whole point of this match with Catherine and Peter was to try and bring closer ties between Russia and Prussia at the expense of someone like Austria. Uh, and there had been an attempt before that. I think Catherine, um, or not Catherine, Elizabeth, who was the previous, uh, the empress, um, had tried to marry Charles Augustus, um, or, or maybe it was his brother, and he died. But they, whatever it was, they tried to make a match before this uh, 30, 40 years earlier, and it didn't work out. Let me take a look. I want to get that right. Okay, so yeah, it was it was Charles Augustus of Holstein, who was the eldest son of Christian Augustus, is who she was supposed to marry. Um, but he ended up dying in 1727 before they could get married. Um, so, you know, that kind of was a blow to that attempt to uh, bring closer ties between Russia and Prussia. Then Peter offered Prussia peace, giving back everything that had been won by Russian sacrifice and strength of arms. It was the second miracle of the House mm. of Brandenburg. It saved Prussia and Frederick the Great, but it sat ill with the Russian people. It sat even worse with the Russian military and nobility. Catherine was horrified. Peter was more concerned with his title as Duke of Holstein than being Tsar of Russia. So this is interesting because you have a Russian uh, Tsar who's really German, who does something really, really favorable to a very weakened Prussia. And it, like I said, it bails Prussia out. But for all intents and purposes, if you're Russian, especially Russian nobility, you're looking at this and you're thinking, why did we just shed all this blood? Why did we spend all these resources just for this Russian, this German to come in and throw our country under the bus? And, and you have another German, his wife, who takes the side of the Russian people. And so this is really going to be a turning point. He had just given up on the most important war in the world in order to turn all of Russia's might against Denmark so that he might restore some small claim of the House of Holstein that they'd lost years before. And though some of his domestic policies were progressive and hailed as necessary reforms, for the most part, Catherine watched him blunder from one alienating oh, act to another. Even during the funeral of his own aunt, while Catherine showed herself to be the model of orthodox humility and respect, Peter didn't even make an effort to appear to care about orthodox customs and made a mockery of Elizabeth's funeral. He would go even further with his contempt for the church, trying to secularize all church property and even mm. demanding that clergy shave their beards. But it really was the campaign in Denmark that doomed him. 
Such an act, so completely disconnected from the interests of Russia, showing such complete disregard for the honor of the army, or... The, and this is... All throughout history, you'll see this. There are certain rulers that just are completely out of touch with what's going on in their kingdom, uh, in their empire. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth is a perfect example of this. Completely out of touch with what with what's going on. Tsar Nicholas the Second, clearly out of touch. And you could argue how much of that is the people around them insulating them from what's really going on or misleading them in some way. But inevitably, people who are completely out of touch end up losing their kingdoms. Or even the well-being of its men was one step too far. And more foolishly still, against the direct counsel of Frederick the Great, the very man who he so admired, and whose peer he now considered himself to be, Peter let this little war pull him away from Moscow, to remove him from the center of power and the court. Soon, a plot began to form to replace Peter. And at the center of that plot was his replacement, his Catherine. wife. Join us next time oh, for a, yeah. a coronation and a queen. Oh, man. It's getting good now. Can't wait to get into the next part of this. Uh, as always, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, and we'll see you again tomorrow with part three. Thanks for watching. Welcome back, everyone, to part three of our look at Catherine the Great by Extra History. Took a day off from this series yesterday uh, to enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday with the family. I hope for all of you who may have celebrated as well that you had a fantastic day uh, spending time with family uh, and just hopefully appreciating uh, all that you have to be thankful for. And our thoughts and prayers are with anybody who maybe had an empty chair at the Thanksgiving dinner table this year, as I know our family did. So uh, we're ready to dive back into this. Uh, a lot of exciting things happening over on the gaming channel as well. Uh, I did start a new Grand Tactician Civil War campaign, did episode two today. Tomorrow, episode one of my uh, Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts British 1890 campaign uh, starts off. I just recorded that, so that'll be going live. So if you're interested in naval warfare, especially in the age of Dreadnoughts, you might want to check that out. The link's in the description to check out the gaming channel. I uh, would love to have you over there, but it's time to dive into Catherine the Great Part 3. If you didn't see the first two parts of this uh, reaction series, the link's in the description of Part 1, as well as the link uh, to the original content. Let's go. For months, Catherine, together with one of her lovers, had been working with men high in government and the military to replace what they all saw as a disastrous and incompetent emperor, Peter. They'd been slowly putting out bribes and winning the hearts of the local guard regiments in St. Petersburg, but on the night of June 27th, it all came to a head due to a slip of the tongue. So, you know... There have been other times in history that spouses have overthrown their spouse uh, and taken either taken the kingdom for themselves or taken the uh, kingdom for their child. Um, and I know some of you complain that I constantly use comparisons to England, but listen, 65% of this channel uh, is the United States, England, and Australia, uh, English-speaking people. So uh, a lot of ties to that history, but. Um, Edward II, uh, who was king after Longshanks, uh, he's the guy that you see portrayed in the movie um, Braveheart. He's kind of the uh, the weak uh, son of King Edward I, uh, is eventually overthrown by his wife Isabella of France uh, and her lover Roger Mortimer uh, to supposedly rule in the name of their of her son Edward III, but really Roger Mortimer is running the show, and eventually Edward the the third has to overthrow his mother and her lover. Uh, but you don't often see it happen in the first months of that spouse's reign like it does in this case. I mean, this is the same year that he took uh, the throne. June 27th, 1762. A soldier in one of the guard regiments in St. Petersburg gets spooked. He turns to one of his officers and asks if it's true that the conspiracy against the emperor has been found out. Turns out the officer he just asked is one of the few who was not in on the plot. <laughs> the soldier is arrested on the spot. As so, it is it true the conspiracy's been found out? Uh, conspiracy. Yeah, 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 the conspiracy. Yeah. Come with me. Oh, man. Oops. Is one of the guard officers who is central to the rebellion. The time is now or never. 
The revolt must begin. So this may, reminds me too, and this happens sometimes where things get found out and kind of all the plans go out the window and you have to act in a hurry. Uh, the Doolittle Raid, uh, when in, in April of 1942, where you have this uh, really bold plan by the United States to launch army bombers off of an aircraft carrier, uh, bomb Japan's mainland, uh, bomb Tokyo, and then fly and land safely in uh, free China. Uh, well, they get spotted by a civilian ship, and they have to launch way sooner than they wanted to, and kind of everything gets thrown out of whack. The principal conspirators gather, panicked. A man named Panin, a man who would go on to be one of Catherine's highest officials, stays them, saying their freedom could only be assured for a few hours, so they must act, and they must act now. The brother of Catherine's paramour is dispatched to Peterhof, the palace outside of St. Petersburg where Catherine's staying. He dashes out and pulls aside the first carriage he can find. Money makes the driver push the horses hard through the night. Meanwhile, Peter is asleep at Oranienbaum, a small post outside of Petersburg where he's... Well, at least he's not playing with toy soldiers, you know? I mean, at least he found something else to do. He's sleeping. Uh, so isn't it interesting? You've got the Winter Palace, which is kind of like the White House, so to speak, uh, in St. Petersburg, which, remember, is a very new city at this point. Um, it's not very often in history that entirely new capital cities get built from scratch. Uh, Brazil did it in the 20th century with Brasilia. Uh, I can't think off the top of my head of other situations. The United States did it with uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, in the last part of the 18th century, so a few decades after this. Uh, but you've got them staying at other places outside of St. Petersburg. Interesting. Staying to observe one of his regiments before his Danish adventure. The brother of Catherine's lover arrives just as Catherine is waking at 5 a.m. The time has come, he says. He quickly relays the night's event. Skipping all the elaborate dress of a high lady of the time, Catherine immediately rushes to the carriage. The horses are exhausted from the travel of the previous night, but as they are crawling down the road toward the capital, a farm wagon on its way to morning market passes. They stop it, and the Empress Consort pushes money into the farmer's hand. She has his two great farm horses tethered to her carriage right then and there, hmm. and they speed towards St. Petersburg. Out in the drill yard, Peter is making his small contingent of Holstein soldiers parade before him. A messenger brings news of the arrest of the guards and the possible conspiracy. Peter shrugs it off. And here's the thing. I mean, if he had been the kind of person who was going to be a decent ruler then that would have caused him to act. But it just reveals a little bit more of his character, that he's like aloof. He's, you know, whatever, not a problem. One by one, Catherine goes to the barracks of each of the guard units stationed in Petersburg. One by one, the regiments swear fealty to we her got in a you, jubilous girl. tumult. Meanwhile, Peter is playing violin in his room. A man rushes in to tell him he has a message about how... All right, I, I, I'm bringing up a lot of parallels, but boy, there are so many parallels. You've got the the supposed story of Nero fiddling while Rome burns, uh, which you know is, has gone down in history as kind of a description of people. Um, you know, you see that meme all the time with, I don't know which cartoon it's from. Is it Adventure Time? Where he's standing there and everything's burning around him and it's like, this is fine. That's what's happening here. This guy is so unbelievably clueless that his world is burning down around him. And he doesn't care. But again, it just reveals who he already was. Uh, and, you know, these people have done their homework and they've put everything into place to where even if he did try to act at this point, what's he going to do? His own home guards all like, yeah, we're good. Because they even see how weak this guy is. Happenings in the capital. Annoyed at the interruption, Peter tells the man to put it on the table. He'll read it later. He never does. Surrounded by guards, a procession with Catherine at its center makes its way to the Cathedral of Our Lady Kazan, where the Archbishop of Novgorod pronounces her sovereign autocrat of Russia. They didn't even wait to, like, apprehend her husband and overthrow him uh, to do this. They just went ahead and did it. And another parallel here, uh, after Henry VIII's son, uh, Edward VI, dies, he had made a last-minute change to his will which named his cousin um lady jane gray as the queen the problem in that case was that they proclaim her queen without making sure that edward's sister mary is in custody first 
And in that case, Mary, who is a Catholic, rallies people, especially Catholics, who want to see the country go back to uh, obedience to Rome, gather around her, and they're able to overthrow Lady Jane Grey. It was a huge mistake in that case. But in this case, you don't have the kind of person who can do this. But that could have been a mistake if he had been made of tougher stuff. But he's not. Meanwhile, Peter orders a caravan of carriages assembled to take him and his guest back to Peterhof to have a feast. He forgets to order the usual cavalry escort. I love how they're telling the story, though. an ever-growing mob process to the Winter Palace. There she meets with assembled members of the Senate and the Holy Synod, the highest religious council of Russia. She declares that, out of love for Russia and the Orthodox faith, she had been moved to such action that, at the urging of her subjects, against an emperor who imperiled them, she took the throne to deliver Russia from foreign powers and foreign religion. And she's already been laying the groundwork for this, right? She's already gotten people to love her. It's not like this is coming out of left field. They already feel strongly that she loves the Russian people, that she's committed to the Orthodox Church. And so for her to say these things, even though it may be secretly self-serving, they're obviously going to buy it. They're going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, because they've seen what potential there is in continuing to follow him and they're not going to stand for it. Which, I mean, bold move, considering she herself was a foreigner who had come to Russia with a foreign religion, but hey, nobody was really sweating the details at the time. Meanwhile, Peter's group of revelers arrive at Peterhof, only to find no one there. Crickets. Peter is furious. <laughs> he storms through the house looking for Catherine. She spoiled his party. To one of his entourage, he screams in rage at her unthinking discourtesy. Didn't I always tell you she was capable of anything? A few of the more senior members of the party offer to head to St. Petersburg to see if they can find her. They had probably put two and two together by this point. Way too late. The embassy from Peter's company arrives. One of them begs Catherine not to take up arms against her husband. She takes him by the elbow and leads him to a balcony. Gesturing to the ecstatic crowd, she says, Deliver your message to them. <laughs> the small group... <laughs> There's a word for this. I'm not going to use it, but it starts with bad. Uh, dang, that is hardcore. Okay. You want to you wanna make your case? Make your case. Uh, boy, she called his bluff. Big time. I love it. Group of messengers all swear fealty to Catherine or ask to be allowed to retire. Meanwhile, Peter has gotten his first concrete news of all the goings-on from the crew of a firework barge that was sailing to Peterhof to provide the fireworks for his party. But all their information is still vague because they had left early in the morning, as they'd been ordered to go deliver the fireworks. Peter, enraged, orders word to be sent to a Hranienbaum to get his Holstein regiment. He shouts that he would defend himself to the death. His men arrive and are posted along the road to the capital. But no one thought to tell them that there might be a fight, so they only brought their wooden parade ground rifles. A Russian uniform is found for Peter, because he was still wearing the German one that he liked so much. <laughs> <His ed> ed <laughs> this guy's so out of touch. He's still wearing a German uniform, and he's, he's the Tsar of Russia. <laughs> My gosh. Could you be any more incompetent? No wonder you lost your, your job, dude. Advisors gather around him. One counsels that he donned the uniform, ride at full haste to the capital, and remind the people who they had late sworn an oath that. to. Another recommends that he meet up with a larger contingent of the army 70 miles away, and then march on St. Petersburg. A third recommends he flee to Germany. He does... <laughs> Monty Python reference. I don't know if you caught that. Let's go back to it. A third recommends he flee. So in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, uh, there's this whole scene where they're talking up this cave that they have to go to. It's called the Cave of Kyle Banog. And, uh, but then this Tim the Enchanter warns them. He says, But if you do doubt your courage or your strength, come no further, for death awaits you all with nasty, big, pointy teeth. And he does this whole dramatic scene, and they're like, quite an eccentric performance. And can you tell I really love that movie? Uh, and then they show up expecting to see this vile creature, and it's a rabbit. And so then 
Arthur tells one of his knights, go on, chop his head off, and it jumps up and bites him on the neck and beheads him right away. And so then they all run away, and they see the bones strewn everywhere, and Tim the Enchanter's laughing about this killer rabbit who just scared off the knights of the round table. And, and, and so run away, run away is a line from the movie. He to Germany. He does nothing. Men are sent to secure a nearby island fortress. This fortress is still loyal. So, <laughs> your advisors give you three options. You could do this, you could do this, or could do this. Or I could do nothing at all. Yeah, let's do that. Oh my gosh, this guy. At least this was good news. Catherine had gotten the backing of the Synod, the people, the army, and all the her Senate ducks without in a row. firing a shot. But there was one last thing she had to do. Peter had to formally abdicate. As was the right of the sovereign, she had taken on the rank of the colonel of the Preobrazhinsky guards. Borrowing pieces of a uniform from any of the men who seemed about her size, she strode out to meet her soldiers in the brilliant green of the guards. She would lead the final foray to capture Peter mm. herself. As the march began, a young subaltern rushed up to give her his sword knot, the one piece her uniform yet lacked. This subaltern's name, by the way, was Gregory Potemkin. Peter, meanwhile, chose She'll to withdraw to the name. island fortress he had secured earlier in the evening. As his boat approached, the harbor was closed off to him. He shouted to the men in the fort, Do you not know me? I'm your emperor! To which the reply came, We no longer have an emperor. Long live Empress Catherine II. <laughs> Word traveled fast. My goodness, this guy. In the time between him sending his man to secure the fort and him choosing to finally go there, the top admiral of the navy had sworn allegiance to the new empress and headed to the fort to take over its command personally. Uh. Peter fled into his cabin to hide. When he returned to Peterhof, he dismissed everyone and then went to his room, refusing to speak to his staff. Then he composed a letter to Catherine, apologizing for his bad behavior and offering to share the throne with her. Want to go halvesies? At first light, Catherine receives Peter's letter. She is unimpressed. A few hours later, she receives another letter offering to abdicate if he could just go back to Holstein. She accepts. He writes an abject abdication statement detailing how unfit he is to rule. Needless to say, a few weeks later, he wound up dead in a drunken brawl that was probably a cleverly disguised assassination. And, and this is the thing you end up having to do when you overthrow a monarch happened all throughout history because as long as the former monarch remains alive they are the focus of a potential rebellion as soon as people don't like something that catherine does they could rally to his banner they could uh, raise an army to put him back on the throne it's just the unfortunate reality it happened uh in any country you can look at uh, but it's happened multiple times in England, it's happened in France, it's happened in other places. You overthrow a monarch, that monarch probably has to die. His idol, the man he kept telling himself he was equal to, Frederick the Great, of the affair, Frederick merely said he allowed himself to be dethroned like a child being sent to bed. At Fred is a great big deal. I like that. There's a lot of, and I'm sure I'm missing some of them, but there's a lot of neat little nuggets like this. Uh, Frederick the Great at Fred is a great big deal. Throned like a child being sent to bed. And while Catherine probably had nothing to do with Peter being killed, she did pardon his killers, as his death freed her up to rule without the worry that someone would try and form a counter-rebellion around yep. him. And rule she did, rapidly reversing almost all of Peter's policies. As Russian forces were literally on the verge of engaging with Denmark, riders arrived with Catherine's orders to return home. In fact, that was the order to all the Russian troops in Europe. She was going to begin an era of neutrality, where Russian troops fought on neither side of the Seven Years' War. And for this, the army was forever grateful. The church, on the other hand, was more complex. She put a temporary moratorium on Peter's order to secularize all church land, but Catherine was intent on being an informed ruler. And as reports came into her every day, one thing became more and more clear. Russia was broke. Mm -hmm. Grain prices were soaring, the treasury was filled with IOUs. Ending all the wars would help, but not seeing the reparations which might have been expected with a decisive victory, yeah. Russia was penniless and without any recourse to credit. 
and easily a tenth of all the wealth of Russia was locked up in church lands, wealth that her government needed. And again, there's another parallel here with England, because this is what Henry VIII did, and I'm sure she was aware of this in her own knowledge of history. Uh, Henry VIII did this in the 1500s in the dissolution of the monasteries. There's all this incredible land and property and wealth uh, that's owned by the church, a church that he has now separated from the Roman Catholic Church. And it's sad in terms of history to look at this, and it happened in France too, uh, where you had all of these incredible monasteries that get destroyed, that had so much history and so many of the graves of famous people going back a thousand years or more, and it gets destroyed. And in Henry VIII's case, he gobbles up that wealth. He starts giving the property to people that are loyal to him. Uh, but he saw that as something that could be taken. In Rome, uh, in the Roman Empire, they did this with wealthy citizens. They would find some reason to bring some charge against them uh, so they could acquire all their property and all their, their money uh, to use it to help fund their, their own desires. After a long back and forth with the Senate about the morality of a church which owned so much property but didn't help with the temporal affairs like charity and education, and with a few threats thrown in, Catherine was able to cow them. All church property became state property. More than a million church serfs became peasants, which mm. meant they now had to pay taxes, and all church officials became employees of the state. And this shows the strength of Catherine. Where Peter lost one of the great pillars of the Russian state, and arguably his throne for his policy, Catherine's iron will and careful management of the other... Okay, and that is a Catan reference there. Uh, these are all things that you can have in Catan. That's pretty cool. I like it. ...elements of power allowed her to drag in this vast source of government revenue. But in doing so, it also brought up the other great issue for Catherine. Serfs. Because mm. serfs in Russia were slaves. Yeah. They could be bought and sold, abused with no rights over their own body. They're slaves under a different name. Uh, and it's not exactly the same nature of slavery as, say, in the United States where you have chattel slavery. But uh, there's a lot of parallels. And they, they definitely were slaves in all but name. They could be gambled away or traded. They had no choice but to work the vocation their master chose for them. And they couldn't move or leave the land that they were bound to. And with burgeoning industrial revolution, there came to be a new kind of serf. A serf not owned by a master, but owned by a corporation, many of whom were employed by the great mining enterprises of the Urals. And in these mines, life was ugly, brutish, and short. Because they were I'm chattel, 12. men were literally worked to death, beaten when they paused for a moment in their labor. This treatment caused riots and strikes that would eventually lead to the largest peasant revolt in Russian history. So join us next time for the plight of the serfs, the ghost of Peter III, and the Pugachev Rebellion. All right, interesting stuff. Let me know your thoughts about all of that. Use the comment section below. Don't forget, if you're interested, to check out the gaming channel. Uh, and I will have an announcement coming about a couple of live streams next week, including one just for our patrons and members, but also one for everybody. So be watching for that. Make sure you have your notifications turned on. Thanks for watching. Welcome back, everyone, to episode four of our look at Catherine the Great by Extra History. Yes, we are doing the complete series. I had a couple of people ask me that. I always do the complete series when I do these series like this. Uh, I want to let you know, too, that uh, for patrons and members, the first episode of uh, my visit to the Gettysburg Battlefield, which is about the Iron Brigade, it's about 25 minutes long, uh, is up and available to be seen uh, by those uh, members and patrons. It'll be available for everyone else sometime later this week. Uh, I'm guessing maybe Monday or Tuesday. Uh, as soon as we're done with this Catherine the Great series, we will uh, air the first episode of the Gettysburg series. So uh, be watching for that. But you can see it right now if you're a patron, even at the lowest level. So consider doing that. All of the money that we raise through Patreon uh, goes directly to funding my travel for future trips to do more things like the Gettysburg series. There'll be nine episodes from my series at Gettysburg. We're going to be doing things like the Iron Brigade. We're going to take a look at the history behind some of the monuments at Gettysburg. 
Uh, we're going to talk about what happened after the battle, uh, particularly with uh, the dead and, and what did they do with them and the wounded and things like that. We're going to take a look at the fight on East Cemetery Hill on July 2nd. You're going to get to see some of the highlights of Remembrance Weekend, including the parade, which had... I think thousands of reenactors in the parade. It was really quite something, and I got to watch it with Gary Edelman from the American Battlefield Trust. Um, you're going to get to see some of the highlights of my tour of the battlefield with Gary, which will include Pickett's Charge uh, Field. It'll include uh, the Angle, um, some of the Southern Battlefield, uh, the July 2nd of Longstreet's Assault, uh, Culp's Hill, uh, East Cemetery Hill, a few places like that. So th that's just some of what's coming. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and dive into Catherine the Great, part four. If you didn't see the first three episodes, the link is in the description. With the war in Europe settled and the church finally under her control, Catherine could at last focus on her great project, the law. In her spare time, while not getting distracted by things like getting an ex-lover elected the puppet King of Poland, or corresponding with Voltaire, Catherine focused on writing the Nakaz, a massive set of guidelines for how to rewrite the laws of the land. So what I love about Catherine the Great is that she doesn't just take over the country and then just kind of settle in for a comfortable, nice reign where she doesn't rock the boat too much. I mean, she dives in with both feet and she's going to bring reform. It's not, you know, this to me tells me it's not just about power for her. It's not about being in charge. You know, some people, they just want the power. They want to be in charge and that's really all they're after. And once they have it, they use that power to ingratiate themselves you know to make themselves feel comfortable and, and and better this woman she genuinely seems to really love the russian people and want to try and make things better for them whether that's true or not i guess we'll see these weren't laws mind you but rather guidelines on how to make laws because catherine had a novel idea she would bring together representatives of her people and ask them what problems they faced that needed fixing before she actually went about making new laws. And isn't that kind of refreshing too? A ruler that doesn't just come in and say, all right, I know exactly what my people need and I'm going to do that for them because that happens a lot. And a lot of times the rulers don't have the first clue what their people need. She's actually going to take the time to listen. I like this. And so she assembled representatives from every free class, region, and religion in her empire to come together and discuss what laws needed to be made. And in some ways, this was incredibly inclusive. She had representatives who were Cossacks, representatives who were Muslims, huh. even representatives who were Buddhists. Wow. But there was one group that was left out. That whole free part in free class serfs. meant that there would be no serfs. After all, the serfs' owners could look after their interests, right? But no serfs meant that nine-tenths of the empire went unrepresented. And as for the representatives of the one-tenth who did show up for her great assembly on laws, they were utterly unprepared for it. Of course they were. So, um, you know, just by comparison, in the years before the American Civil War, uh, something like a third, I think, of the South... Or, yeah, I guess it was probably about a third, maybe maybe closer to one half of the, the population of the pre-Civil War South were, were slaves. Um, and, and that was a lot. I mean, I think in Mississippi, it was about half of the population were slaves. In Russia, nine-tenths of the population are serfs. I mean, this is a recipe for revolt if the serfs ever figure out that they make up the vast majority of the country. There really hadn't been much involvement in government in Russia up to this point. And truth be told, many of the people involved held at least some suspicion that this was a trick or some sort of loyalty test. For the first time... <laughs> so, think about this. If you are a person in authority and you've got this empress who has just taken over the country uh, by usurping her own husband... Uh, and now she calls together everyone and says, we're going to have this, you know, get together to discuss the, you know, the welfare of the kingdom. Um, you can see why some of them might be suspicious and think, wait, wh why should, why she want to do that? And then some of them start to overthink this and think, well, it's really just a loyalty test. She wants to see if we're going to be loyal to her. The problem is when people only are worried about 
saying what you want to hear. You don't hear the things you need to hear. And that happens with a lot of rulers. Usually it's because of people who rule by fear. Like, you know, Stalin, for example, uh, rules by fear and people aren't going to say the things to him that he needs to hear because they're worried about saving their own skin. In this case, it's not that she has ruled by that fear, but it's still that those people have that fear. Many meetings, they debated what honorific to award Catherine. If you are wondering, the great just narrowly beat out all wise mother of the fatherland. <laughs> the great narrowly beat out all wise mother of the fatherland. I like that. Catherine found this infuriating. Did they not understand that she had called them here to help her figure out what laws to make? Not oh, so <laughs> This reminds me of the years after uh, the United States uh, passed the Constitution and George Washington becomes the first president. Uh, John Adams is the vice president, and one of the vice president's roles is as the president of the Senate. And so he kind of jumps in with both feet. John Adams, you know, is a is a pretty straightforward guy. He uh, he likes to kind of speak his mind and. He gets in there and starts running the Senate, and, and one of their first orders of business is to have this big debate about what should we call the president. Uh, and they start having all these like discussions along a similar line about His Excellency, the President of the United States, Grand Potentate, you know, um, His Majesty, the President, you know, stuff like that. Same kind of thing. Not to just give her titles? Well, no. In fact, a fair number of them couldn't even read the guidelines she gave them, and even fewer really understood the heavy Enlightenment philosophy which formed the basis of the Nakaz, which meant that getting anything useful from them was like pulling teeth. <laughs> the merchants wanted the rights of nobles. The nobles wanted to be able to engage in commerce as merchants. And So she gathers these people together to have a discussion about the welfare of the realm, and all they're concerned about is their own rights. So this is an opportunity to get my group of people ahead. And of course, remember, the one group of people that makes up most of the country, they're not even there to have their voice heard. So it's just a bunch of spoiled, uh, entitled brats there to get their piece of the pie. The peasants mostly gave very specific complaints about how that jerk Boris from the next village over keeps letting his cows trample my fence. Can we make a law about that? Catherine was an autocrat at heart. She believed in absolutism, but she wanted data. She felt that an <laughs> A little Star Trek reference there. It's Data, who's an android from Star Trek. That's funny. Crat should rule with knowledge and understanding, but knowledge and understanding were in short supply in these meetings. Finally, after much frustration, the whole affair was called... Just forget Foreign it. Foreign events had become more pressing. Remember when I mentioned that Catherine had put a puppet on the Polish throne? Well, she'd been having that puppet do things that were more and more clearly against the best interest of the Poles. The Polish people finally rebelled, and the Russian army was sent in to put the rebellion down. But in doing so, a Russian regiment chased fleeing Polish insurgents into Ottoman territory. Which is interesting that's similar to what happens with uh, Charles XII of Sweden when he is in Poland and gets his butt kicked, he flees to the Ottomans. The French had been leaning on the Ottomans to get into the Polish conflict for some time, and this seemed like just the excuse. So the Ottomans locked up the Russian ambassador and went to war. This turned out to be a poor decision on the Ottomans' part. Once seen as near equals, the Russians belied expectations and delivered the Ottomans a series of crushing defeats. On land, the Russian forces, led in small part by one Grigory Potemkin, seemed invincible. And if you remember, this is the guy who we briefly saw yesterday, um, who when Catherine puts on her Russian uniform, uh, is missing one small part to that uniform, and it's Grigory that comes up and gives her what she needs to complete the ensemble. And at sea, where the Turks thought themselves to be unopposed because the Russians had no port on the Black Sea, the Russians conceived of a bold plan to take the Baltic fleet, sail it all the way around Europe, and surprise the Ottoman fleet from the rear. And this is why they're going to want the Crimea later, because that gives them that uh, Sevastopol, I think it is, the big port on the Black Sea. The plan worked. The Ottoman navy suffered massive losses at little cost to the Russians. But the Russians didn't get quite as much from the war as might first have been supposed, partly because of pressure from other foreign entities who didn't want to upset the balance of power too greatly, and partly because something curious was happening back home in the Urals. 
But first we must talk of the treaty that ended the war, the Treaty of Kachuk Kainarza. It gave the Russians a fair swath of territory, but most importantly, it gave Russia ports on the Black Sea, which had been one of their strategic goals for a very long time. Yep. It also provided war reparations, which helped with the ongoing problem of Russia being kinda broke. Lastly, it made Russia the protector of Orthodox Christians living in the Ottoman Empire. And what that is, is a standing casus belli, right? Uh, it's anytime we need an excuse to go to war with the Ottomans, we can fall back on, but we're the protector of the Christians. And, and here's what's happening to the Christians in the Ottoman Empire. So now we need to go to war. So it's always, it's kind of that get out of jail free card in the back of your pocket that you can pull out whenever you need an excuse to go to war with these people. Something that will absolutely come up if we ever cover the Crimean War. Alright, so, with the war against the Ottomans thus concluded, Catherine could turn to another niggling issue. The fact that half of her country was up in arms. At first it seemed like a small revolt, a little nothing out in the boonies. But then, when Catherine sent a force to pacify it, that force was defeated. So she sent another force out to pacify it, and the commander lost his head. Literally. This was getting to be a problem. In fact, it was a huge problem, one that would require- Alright, hold on a second. I need to find out exactly what were the circumstances of the commander losing his head. So it's called Pugachev's Rebellion, and the only uh, reference to any beheadings that I could find was for Pugachev himself when he was eventually um, beheaded and dismembered and, and uh, all that kind of fun stuff at the end of that rebellion. So I'm sure there's a lot more detail that I could get into with that, but that gives us a little uh, more context, and it takes place right around the time that the American Revolution is beginning, the mid-1770s. And that would require the help of some of those troops that had been tied up fighting the Ottomans to solve. Because what had started out as a small group of discontented Cossacks had grown into the largest peasant rebellion Russia had ever seen. The horrible conditions of serfdom, the increase in tax collectors and government officials messing with Cossack affairs, and discontent of the old believers with the Orthodox hierarchy meant that these groups had become dry tender just waiting for a lit match. And a man named Pugachev had fanned that discontent into a firestorm. Pugachev claimed that he was Peter III, that he had escaped the attempt on his life, and that his wife and the evil nobles had deposed him because he was about to sign into law a decree freeing all the serfs. <laughs> That's pretty gutsy. And this is a common thing that happens, too. Uh, in the aftermath of Henry VII taking over in England, uh, which is Henry Tudor, he's the father of Henry VIII, uh, when he defeats Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth, becomes king, um, there are these occasional rebellions that uh, rise up uh, in the name of some member of the Plantagenet family who claims to be still alive. So you have one guy who comes along uh, who claims to be Richard, the Duke of York, who was the younger of what are known as the princes in the tower. His older brother was Edward V. Uh, these are the two that were... Uh, Edward V was overthrown by Richard III, and then they were put in the tower and then kind of just disappeared. And nobody really knows for sure what happened to him. Uh, and so you have those kinds of things happening. So even when you uh, successfully eliminate uh, the opposition, the person who people might rise up in rebellion against, uh, you can have somebody come along and claim to be that person. And this is the 1700s. It's not like you can do a DNA test to prove whether or not they are. So as long as people believe that they are that person, they're still willing to rise up. And when you come along and say something like, I was about to free from slavery the 90% of our population who is currently enslaved, that's going to win some followers, whether they believe you're really that guy or not. They're willing to believe it if it means getting their freedom. He was also offering freedom of religion and a tax-free return to the traditional way of life for the Cossacks. To a lot of people, that sounded like a pretty good deal. And for a year, they held sway over vast parts of Russia, often dealing savagely with any nobles unlucky enough to cross their path. But at last, as the troops began to pour back from Ottoman lands, Catherine sent out an overwhelming force to snuff out the rebellion. But even as this fire was being put out, a much worse specter flared up. Smallpox. Smallpox mm. was still the bane of Europe. No one was safe from it, noble or commoner, king or priest. 
It had just burnt through the Austrian royal family. Now, by this point, there is a primitive understanding of inoculation, uh, vaccination as we would call it today. Uh, but the way it worked was they would come around. Uh, they actually portray this in the HBO miniseries uh, John Adams. And they would come around with a smallpox infected person on a cart. And they would you know, put a cut in your healthy body they would scrape some of the smallpox from one, so like the pus from one of the um, the smallpox um, boils on your skin, and rub it into the uh, uninfected person's body, uh, thereby infecting you with smallpox, but hopefully in such a way that your body will fight it off. And, and most of the time, it worked. It occasionally killed people too. Uh, but if you felt you know smallpox is breaking out, and there's a good chance I'm going to get it and die from it it was a chance you were willing to take. Uh, so I don't know if that knowledge and uh, treatment had made its way to Russia at, at this point or not. Destroying their line of succession. And here Catherine was, never having contracted it. Perhaps worse still, here her son was, with whispers all around court of the uncertainty of his ever ascending the throne, because he had not yet suffered and survived the disease. Catherine herself said that she lived in fear of the disease every day. Too many people she had mm. known had been claimed by it. So at last, student of the enlightenment that she was, she took a bold step. Yep. She summoned a doctor from Britain to inoculate her. There it is. This science was fairly new at the time. And though the doctor she brought in was one of the experts in the field, everyone thought her mad. <laughs> many were convinced that she would die. But she lived. After a few small pustules and some aches, she was fit and forever inured against the disease. Soon, she had her son inoculated too. But she didn't just do this for herself. She knew that her people were a wary, suspicious people, especially when it came to disease. She hoped that, by her example, she could convince others to get inoculated too. And it worked. Soon, nice. much of the court followed her example. In fact, she had inoculation stations set up in most of the provinces, and a large number of Russians benefited from this, one of the true wonders of modern medicine. So I guess that answers my question uh, about whether or not the technology had made its way to <laughs> Russia yet. Um, good. And by doing it herself and, and um, making sure that she was willing to do it, that gives other people a lot more confidence. Well, the Empress did it? All right, I can do it then. There would be other plagues during her tenure as Empress, some unthinkably terrible. But this one great lingering fear, this one tragedy that once fell on almost every house, this she was able to do something about. By the end of her reign, nearly two million Russians would be inoculated. Mm. But with the home front quiet, and her efforts on medicine and childcare taking root, it was time again to look beyond the borders of Russia. Or perhaps more accurately, to the borders of Russia and how they might be expanded. Join us next time for Changing Alliances, Sprawling Wars, and the Partition of Poland. Oh yeah, the first partition of Poland. So there's, I think, several of those that take place. Uh, interesting. So we will come back with that tomorrow. And uh, it is the day of the big game. I'm heading over to my grandpa's to watch the game here in just a few minutes. Go Bucks. Welcome back, everybody, to part five of my reaction to uh, Extra History's Catherine the Great. A little later in the day than usual, getting this up to you guys. Today was my son's birthday party. We had family over for a good bit of the afternoon after church. So um, family comes first. I think you guys all understand that. So I did want to get content to you today. So we're going to do this. Tomorrow will be part six on Monday. Uh, and then on Tuesday, uh, the first episode uh, of my series from the Gettysburg Battlefield will go live. It's my episode, it's about 25 minutes long, on the Iron Brigade, a little history of the Iron Brigade, and then we'll explore the battlefield where they fought uh, at Gettysburg, not only where they fought in, on July 1st, but also where they were stationed over on Culp's Hill on July 2nd and July 3rd. Give you a little of the background and let you see some of the sites associated with the Iron Brigade. With each one of the nine episodes of my series from Gettysburg, uh, those are going to go live probably three or four days early for our patrons and our members. Uh, so if you want to sign up uh, to support this channel in that way, you'll get a uh, first look at those videos. The Gettysburg video, uh, episode one, The Iron Brigade, is already available to patrons right now. 
and it'll be available to everybody else on Tuesday morning. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into part five of Catherine the Great. At a young age, Catherine had been married to an emotionally stunted young man who never loved her. For years, she had remained trapped, until she was won over by a callous rake who later abandoned her. She then met a man of whom she was very fond, and whom she would eventually make the king of Poland. But none of these men had truly won her heart. No, the man to be her first great love turned out to be the same man who had helped her ascend the throne years before. Grigory Orlov. For 13 years, she was faithful to him. But that was soon to end. Grigory Orlov was brave and bold, never flinching at danger or personal risk. But he was also boorish, rude, and impertinent. He was ill-educated, with no interest in any of the Enlightenment ideas that Catherine so fancied. Catherine would mm. once write that, despite it all, she would have stayed with him for a lifetime if only he stayed with her. But Grigory sought danger. He was restless, unfaithful, and, worst of all to Catherine, he had grown distant. Yeah, there's nothing worse than being devoted and faithful to someone who's not willing to do the same for you. Uh, there's a certain level of betrayal there that I think is different than you might otherwise experience from someone. Uh, and, you know, for someone who she herself had uh, kind of betrayed her husband, I guess is one way you could look at it, by overthrowing him and taking his throne, um, to give that faithfulness is not something that came lightly for her. Uh, so that had to have been very painful for her, especially when, you know, when you are somebody who's used to being in charge and used to getting your way and used to being in control, to not be able to control that had to have been very difficult and painful for her. She sent him off on a diplomatic mission. There he failed, displaying the same arrogance that he had displayed at court, the same uncouth rudeness and mm. sense of superiority that had gotten him hated by her nobles. But it didn't really matter at this point. Catherine had sent him away because she was already done with him. Too long had she suffered his infidelity, his harsh words, his sense that he was superior to the Empress herself. Hmm. As his replacement, Catherine picked up a safe, pretty, dull young man who she would rapidly come to call the most boring man in all of Russia. What? She found her time with him interminable. Not because he didn't try, and not because he was unrefined like Orlov, but because he never had anything interesting to say. But then, she found Potemkin. He had first caught... And yeah, we've been foreshadowing Potemkin for a couple of episodes now, uh, if you kind of picked up on that. And it's one of the things I love about Catherine the Great, or about, not Catherine the Great, about extra history. Uh, I've said this before, they're very good at, in the context of giving big historical events giving you micro looks, you know, giving you a story and tying it all together. They're very good at writing the story and telling it in a compelling way. And so they've been foreshadowing this for a couple of episodes now. Her attention by giving her his sword knot on the day she took the throne. He had performed numerous services for Catherine. He'd been her envoy to Sweden, bringing word of the palace coup. He had been her lay representative on the Most Holy Synod. He'd been paymaster of the army, and he'd even been appointed as guardian of exotic peoples. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what does that title even mean? Guardian of exotic peoples. I need to look this up. So this is a book, uh, visual text, ceremonial text, text of exploration. Uh, and this is under the chapter on uh, signs of empire, exotic peoples at imperial Russian coronations. And so what it says here is the exotic peoples were both a part of and foreign to the Russian state order, marginal elements prompting responses of both, fa both fascination and fear. Uh, so um, the exotic peoples, you, you got to remember that the Russian empire is not just made up of a bunch of Russian people, especially out on the fringes of the empire. You've got a lot of different people groups. Uh, and so I guess that those people groups would be the exotic peoples, the ones who make up a very small portion uh, of the Russian Empire, uh, but are no 
less important in terms of when you become, you know, an emperor, you have to kind of make sure you acknowledge those people and let them know that they're heard too. You know, for example, Queen Elizabeth II would make these trips to places like Kenya or Jamaica or all these Commonwealth realms that are marginally part of what was the British Empire. And so it's acknowledging that those people are part of who we are as well. And it's important to kind of observe what's happening here. She's gone from a guy who she was devoted to, but who was not devoted to her, who kind of um, took advantage of his position and kind of felt he was better than he really was, was rude, you know, did not treat her well. Bounces from that then to a guy that's the total opposite. He's super boring. He rolls over for her, but that's not what she wants either. What she wants is somebody who's maybe not quite an equal, but at least can keep up with her, but is also very good to her. And I think that's what she's looking for in Potemkin. At Catherine's great assembly on laws, he had served valiantly in the Turkish war and won himself renown at every turn. He was a cultured man, not only well studied, but intellectually eager and curious. He had won the top honors at university and then dropped out. He loved theology, but always, especially after being appointed guardian of exotic peoples, kept the company not only of Orthodox hmm. ministers, but also rabbis, old believers, Cossacks, and even members of the tribal religions still alive in the more remote parts of Russia. And this is so important, and I think there's an important lesson to be learned here. We all have to get out of our own bubble, right? You know, if I as a Christian, only spend time with other Christians, I really will not be able to relate to or understand people who are different than me. I had this really just uh, phenomenal message that somebody left for me the other day, uh, a comment on a channel, and he mentioned how he is a center-left atheist and I'm a center-right Christian. We couldn't be more opposite. And yet he was saying how there may not be anywhere else that he feels as welcome as he does here. And that was such an incredible compliment to me to know that he and I, who have very differing views on things like religion and politics, which are supposed to be the hot button issues that set everybody off, and yet we have this common love of history, and we can set aside that other crap uh, and, and, and come together for a common love of history. And it's so important to take the time to get to know people and understand people who are different than you, uh, so that you can, you don't have to agree with them, but you can still respect them. Uh, and accept them as, you know, I would never dismiss a person because they believe differently than me. Um, you know, you take every person as they come. Uh, some of the best people I know, I, I've got a really, really good uh, guy that I got to know in my work with Rachel's Challenge uh, who was a Muslim. And, you know, I'm a Christian, and I'm a pastor. Uh, and we were roommates his first year with Rachel's Challenge. Uh, when we were in training and I'd be sitting there reading my Bible and he's over in the corner on the floor praying to Mecca and we could not have gotten along better. He was such a good dude. And, you know, we need those relationships to get outside of our own um, echo chamber uh, and to get to know people who are different than us. And so I a lot of respect for Potemkin for doing this. He was a great wit, known for impressions and being able to mimic people's voices, which I guess was considered high comedy in those days. He could make Catherine laugh, and through humor, he could say to her what others couldn't say. He was bold, decisive, and highly competent, and soon, Catherine fell in love with him. He was the love of her life. She probably married him. It's one of history's great mm. mysteries, as the wedding would have had to have been a secret and no documents of the event survive, but in her course... Why would it have been a secret? Uh, because this is a time in history, and up until even the last generation or two, um, you know, being divorced was a big no-no in the church. Um, and you couldn't, if you got divorced, then get remarried. Um, you know, look at Henry VIII. He got excommunicated. Uh, he had to break away from the church in order to be able to get divorced and remarried. Um, Queen Elizabeth II's own father, King George VI, only became king because his brother Edward VIII had to step down so he could get married to an, a twice-divorced American. Um, you know, So this was a big, big deal. So they couldn't have publicly had a big church wedding and all that sort of stuff. Respondents, she starts referring to him all the time as her husband. And Although I will say this, I got to stop a second because her husband's dead at this point. So I guess that's no longer a factor. Even if they had been divorced, 
Uh, once he was dead, it wouldn't have mattered anymore. So I don't know what Potemkin's situation was. So maybe that was part of it. Maybe it's because he's not noble enough. I don't know. And to herself as his wife, he was the first man who she felt was her equal, at least in everything but rank. Mm. And he was active in all aspects of court and governance, helping her to execute her will. But, and tragically for Catherine, there is always a but, he was deeply insecure about their difference in power. Uh. For all his qualities, Potemkin could never get over the fact that she could make or unmake him in an instant if she wished. Yeah. That all the power oh. in their relationship was firmly on her side. Every day, he required assurances that she wasn't going to leave him. When she paid attention to any of her former mm. lovers, his jealousy flared. So certain he was that she was about to cast him aside for an old favorite. And jealousy and insecurity and fear, man, will destroy relationships. Think about that. Um, you know, when you have a fear of losing someone, sometimes that fear can drive you to push them away. And you can, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. In your insecurity, you create the situation that you were insecure about in the first place. He alternated between melancholy and anger, and nothing she could ever do could convince him that he wasn't just a passing fancy, mm. that he really was what she wanted. That's tough. And in time, the strain of this broke them. Things got miserable. She spent days in tears, uh. and he hiding in work or in another part of the palace. Passion and love were still there, but they were translated into recriminations and bitterness. At last, she finally decided to see other people. But rather than this destroying what they had, it strengthened them. Huh. While their physical relationship was done, they maintained an incredibly strong bond that simply grew as Potemkin came into his own. Not as her lover, but as her minister. Catherine would abandon lovers if they spoke ill of Potemkin, huh. or were jealous of the space he had in her heart. And Potemkin would serve her loyally all his life, even introducing her to young men with whom he thought she might fall in love. Wow. Their loyalty to each other would overrule any other relationship and any other concern. And for It's complicated, but boy, yeah, sometimes those really complicated relationships happen. I know people who are divorced and have been divorced for 20 years that could not be better friends and get along so well and do family, you know, holidays together and you know and i'm not going to sit in judgment of that i say good for them that they can make that work it's not for everybody but hey good for them from here they could turn to external affairs catherine dispatched potemkin to deliver one of the largest series of territorial gains in russian history as part of the Treaty of Kachuk Kainarja that ended the First Ottoman War, the Crimean Khanate was guaranteed independence from the Ottomans, a guarantee that was backed by the might of Russia. But Catherine and Potemkin saw an opportunity. The great powers of Europe were embroiled in other wars. No one would be able to raise more than a meek protest if faraway Russia expanded her empire. And so they struck while the iron was hot and annexed the Crimean Khanate. An action whose consequences reverberate through to... I was just gonna say, does that not sound familiar? Russia just annexed Ukraine a couple of years ago. And right now, in the news, there's talk of Russia secretly trying to set up a coup for the UK Ukrainian president and them massing troops on the border. This is an ongoing thing. Today. Soon after, they moved to annex the Kingdom of Georgia, and as no one had raised an objection to the bloodless takeover of... And here's another parallel. What does this sound like? 1930s Europe. The Anschluss of Austria taking the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia. Keep pushing it. Okay, they didn't do anything when I did this. They didn't do anything when I did this. And just kind of keep pushing it, and then eventually you go just a little too far. Crimea, Catherine and Potemkin were sure that there would be even less objection to this expansion into a little thought of territory to Russia's south. And they were almost right. No one in Europe really did much about it. But there was one group that cared, and that was the Chechens. And so this action too... Wow, and isn't this interesting? Chechnya, again, a place that in the 1900s becomes a flashpoint for the Russians would have consequences that would echo into today. Potemkin <laughs> was then set to rule the south of Russia, to build cities and bring colonists into these new areas, to pacify hostile tribes and create a new and mighty Black Sea fleet. 
And though all of these expansions brought Russia back into conflict with the Ottoman Empire, where Potemkin had previously been but one of a myriad of generals in the first conflict, here he was supreme commander. He's the guy. He led with aplomb, delivering a number of smashing victories to Catherine. But shortly thereafter, he fell ill and passed, mm. dictating only one last letter to Catherine before death took him. He was a man of luxury and debauchery, of unswerving faithfulness on utter profligacy, of towering ego and absolute insecurity, with appetites mm. to match his intellect and- And you know, those are not as uncommon as you think, having a towering ego, but also incredible insecurity. I think of George S. Patton, the American general in World War II. If you um, read biographies of him and, and see some of the stuff he was writing about in his journals, the guy was- incredibly insecure but when you think of george s Patton, you think of this brash kind of bold egotistical larger than life character but even in his own journals he kind of admits that that's a, a role that he played because he felt that as a general that's what people needed to see but deep down on the inside he was really a very different person and a lot of people are like that his ability but perhaps the austrian field marshal linia put it best I here behold a commander-in-chief who looks idle and is always busy, who hmm. has no other desk than his knees, no other comb than his fingers, constantly reclined on his couch, yet sleeping neither in night nor in daytime. A cannon shot to which he himself is not exposed disturbs him with the idea that it costs the life of some of his soldiers. That is a really interesting uh, thing to say about a leader. And this is a guy who, you know, has a rela long-term relationship with the Empress. If anybody could have felt disconnected from the common man, it was him. But to to say something like that, that a cannon shot to which he's not exposed bothers him because that means that one of his soldiers is in danger and he's not sharing in that danger. Trembling for others, brave himself. Hmm. Alarmed at the approach of danger, frolicsome when it surrounds him. Wow. Dull in the midst of pleasure surfeited with everything, easily disgusted, morose, inconstant, a profound philosopher, an able minister, a sublime politician, not revengeful, asking pardon for a pain he has inflicted, quickly repairing an injustice, hmm. thinking he loves God when he fears the devil, waving one hand to the females that please him and with the other making the sign of the cross, receiving numberless presents from his sovereign and distributing them immediately to others, hmm. preferring prodigality in giving to regularity in paying, prodigiously rich and not worth a farthing, easily prejudiced in favor of or against anything, talking divinity to his generals and tactics to his bishops, hmm. never reading but pumping everyone with whom he converses, uncommonly affable or extremely savage, the most attractive or repulsive of manners. Aren't we all in some ways kind of a, a dichotomy of things, um, uh, a walking contradiction? Uh, we, we are all capable of that, of being in, you know, known to some people as the friendliest guy and other people think you're the biggest jerk that's ever lived. Uh, very fascinating. Concealing under the appearance of harshness the greatest benevolence of heart like a child wanting to have everything, or like a great man knowing how to do without, hmm. gnawing his fingers or apples or turnips, scolding or laughing, engaged in wantonness or in prayers, summoning 20 aides de camp and saying nothing to any of them, not caring for cold, though he appears unable to exist without furs, always in his shirt without pants or in rich regimentals, barefoot or in slippers, almost bent double when he's at home, and tall, erect, proud, handsome, noble, and majestic when he shows himself to his army, like Agamemnon in the midst of the monarchs of Greece. Mm. What then is his magic? Genius, natural abilities, an excellent memory, artifice without craft, the art of conquering every heart, much generosity, graciousness, and justice in his rewards, and a consummate knowledge of mankind. Mm. However you view him, he served Catherine to the end. And in the end, he was the love of her life. Before his death, though, there was one thing that Potemkin didn't get to resolve, and that was the matter of Poland. Uh. Join us next time as we delve into the disappearance of Poland from the map of Europe until 1918, the shifting alliances of Austria, Prussia, and Russia, and the last days of Catherine, and the succession to her throne. 
And so that, and we always talk about how everything's connected. These things that are about to unfold are going to have reverberations, as they've already said, into the modern era. And we'll be able to trace the line of events that have taken place over the last 250 years back to some of these things we're going to talk about in this next episode. Fascinating stuff. Hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, and I'll see you back here tomorrow with part six. Thanks for watching. Welcome back, everyone, to the sixth and final part of our reaction series to Catherine the Great on Extra History. I hope you guys have been enjoying this as much as I have. If you have not seen the first five parts, there's a link in the description that will take you all the way back to part one. Also, to let you know, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, my first episode from my trip to Gettysburg will be live. It's the story of the Iron Brigade, not only their history before the Battle of Gettysburg, but mostly centered around what happened during the Battle of Gettysburg. Part two of that Gettysburg series will be the story of three uh, young people of Gettysburg and their tragic fate, the story of Jack Skelly, Jenny Wade, and Wesley Culp. And that'll be coming next week sometime. So be watching for that. If you are not already subscribed, please check and make sure to see whether you're subscribed. Uh, a friend of mine whose t-shirt I'm wearing today, JD from the History Underground, um, has been having a lot of issues lately with people who were subscribed noticing they are no longer subscribed. So just want to make sure that you check that just to see if that's happening for you. If it does happen, if you were previously subscribed and you find you're not anymore, let me know in the comment section below. I'm just curious to see if that's happening for us like it is for JD. Let's go ahead and dive into part six. Once the terror of Eastern Europe, Poland had long been in decline. Catherine aimed to make that decline permanent. When Catherine first made war on the Ottomans, the biggest losses ended up being suffered by the Poles rather than the Ottoman Empire. For years, Catherine had a puppet, a former lover on the throne of Poland, but keeping him there and keeping him doing the bidding of Russia was becoming more and more difficult. And you know, whenever you say former lover, there's always that risk of, you know, what, you know, there, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, that's true for a lover scorned, too. And, um, you know, so you got to be careful. It, it's a dangerous thing to have somebody who's a former anything, somebody that you're trying to rely on. Vast amounts of troops and treasure were required to keep Poland passive. And as you might remember, the first Russo-Ottoman conflict was, at least officially, caused by Russian troops chasing Polish rebels over the border into Ottoman territory. But Poland was at the center of everything. Literally. The three great powers in Eastern Europe at the time were Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And in the middle of all of them sat Poland. Question for my European friends. Does Prussia really kind of qualify as Eastern Europe. I've always kind of thought of that as being kind of Central Europe. Um, I guess I always kind of thought of Eastern Europe as Russia, Poland, um, the Balkans, but you know, I guess, I don't know. How do, you, how do you determine what's Eastern Europe? So Poland became the solution for a very thorny problem that faced the King of Prussia, Frederick the Great. You see, Frederick had agreed to a secret alliance with Catherine, but the terms of it were very specific. If either of them fought with one of the other powers, all the other had to do was provide some financial support. But if either was attacked and ended up fighting two powers, well, the other one had to go all in joining their side. Now, Frederick really didn't like the idea of actually militarily supporting Russia. He wanted them on his side and all, but the Seven Years' War had really done a number on his forces and his mm. treasury. And in the Ottoman conflict, Russia was being a true pain and stomping the Turks far more than anybody really thought they would, which of course worried Austria, who needed the Ottomans as a counterbalance to Russia. Naturally, this meant that the Austrians were about to join the war on the Ottoman side, which would mean that Frederick would have to do the very boring and unfun act of honoring his treaty. See the echoes of what would happen in 1914 with the Great War, with World War I? Um, people getting into a war which triggers a set of alliances which kind of pull other people into a war they otherwise might not have been involved in and some of the same exact parties uh, to that future conflict here prussia germany uh, austria the ottomans russia same with the, some of the same people but Frederick was a crafty fellow. He pondered the problem and did what he seems to have usually done and asked himself, 
how can I kill a whole bunch of birds with one stone? Because he really wanted a couple of things. First, he didn't want to have to send troops to fight some Russian war. Second, he wanted the Ottomans to owe him, in case he ever needed to use them against the Austrians or the Russians. And then there was this thorny issue of that big gap in his territory, mm. making it much harder to defend. So and again, that big gap in territory is going to come back to haunt uh, Europe when it comes to World War II, because uh, in the aftermath of World War I, you have that happen because um, they give Poland that access to the sea. Uh, which in an otherwise landlocked country because they don't have any of this at that point. And that cuts off East Prussia from the rest of Germany. So we say it all the time. History doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it absolutely does rhyme. So he proposed a solution. Rather than Russia continuing to kick the Turks around and taking large portions of their territory, what if they took a big piece of Poland instead? And then, to maintain the balance of power, Austria could go in and take the most populous parts of Poland. And him, well, he would just take this wee bitty bit over there. A bit that happened to be the most strategically important for him, and provided him more ports on the Baltic. So this is the brilliance of diplomacy. When you are able to convince other people that they got the better end of the deal, or that they really benefited, but you got exactly what you wanted... Uh, so that's what's happening here is Prussia really wants this piece of land here. Uh, and if they can just make Austria and Russia feel like they really made out well while they get the piece that they really want, well, hey, you know, if, if Poland has to suffer, whatever, you know. So his solution was proposed, and basically everybody was like, eh, sure, that works. And so, with plenty of urging from the surrounding Russian soldiers, they got Catherine's puppet in Poland to call the Polish version of a parliament to ratify the agreement. Of course, not enough members showed up to actually ratify the thing, but that wouldn't be a problem. The first thing those who did show up decided to do was change the rules. And thus, huge segments of Poland became Russian, Austrian, and Prussian overnight. From and Poland, they're thinking, okay, if we just pacify them, if we just give them what they ask for, what could go wrong? You know, everybody will be good, we'll be happy, we lose some land, sure, but at least we don't get gobbled up completely, right? Right? From then on, any time Poland did anything Russia didn't like, Russia would just send the troops in. Then Prussia would suggest that they all just take another bite out of Poland, until finally, near the end of Catherine's rule, everyone just agreed to do away with the nuisance that was the ever-in-revolt state of Poland. But as Catherine's life came to its close, and the last chapter in the reign of Catherine the Great was being penned, all thoughts were on one thing, the succession. Mm. And here, perhaps, for all of Catherine's triumphs, was her greatest failing. And remember, there's a lot of questions about whether or not her son really was the product of her relationship with her husband, which is going to be an issue. The place where her own weaknesses and insecurities show through. The tragedy of her reign was that she left behind no one to carry on her legacy. After her, Russia would never again have a truly great emperor. Her son would grow up to be like the husband Catherine had despised. When he was born, little Paul had been whisked away by the then Empress Elizabeth. For eight years, Elizabeth had had maids and servants raise the boy, and when he was at last returned to Catherine, there was a distance between them that could never be bridged. The young man expected the warmth and attention that he'd never received during mm. those years apart from his mother. And while Catherine tried, Paul would always be jealous of the men in Catherine's life, as she seemed to focus more of her energy on them than on him. And this was compounded by Catherine's own paranoia. She saw her son not as an assistant and an heir, but a as threat. a potential rival, yep. as the one person who might have a more legitimate claim to the throne than she. Yeah, because remember, her whole claim to the throne is that she overthrew her husband. And so a lot of people probably argued very strongly and probably correctly that once her husband was no longer on the throne, that it shouldn't pass to her, but to her son. You know, this happened, as I mentioned earlier, in England when Isabella overthrows her husband, Edward II. She does so in the name of her son, Edward III, who then becomes the king. But she's the one running the show, her and her husband, Roger Mort or her lover, Roger Mortimer. But it was her son who was the heir at that point. You know, 
Paul's really the heir to the throne here, assuming he really is her husband's son. So she kept him away from the halls of government, away from any responsibility, from being an actor in the affairs of state. And slowly, he took to idolizing the father who might not have been mm. his father. He would play with soldiers and march his servants around like Peter had. Catherine and her closest advisors eventually decided this had to stop, and so they sought a wife for him, hoping that being married might make him grow up. So let's talk about this for a second, this whole idolizing his father thing. So what's happening here is you've got a mother who's alive and there, but isn't there, right? So she's kind of kept her son at a distance. They've never had a close relationship. So rather than trying to continue to live up to being like his mother, who he just has been rejected by, now he's got the memory of his dead father, who he's going to uh, try to idolize. And because his father's dead, a lot of times what happens is when people are gone, they get mythologized. They We think of them for all their best qualities and not their worst. And so he starts to idolize his father. We do this with, with military figures all the time. People like uh, Erwin Rommel or Stonewall Jackson, when they die before the end of the war, it's easier to say, wow, boy, they were just so good. And they you know, had all these great qualities because we never saw them ultimately lose and we didn't see some of their failings. And uh, so that's what he's doing here. He's idolizing his father for all the qualities that he thinks uh, he's kind of projecting and, and not necessarily for the weak, ineffective ruler that he was. But his first marriage ended in deep tragedy. His wife died in the birth of their oh. first son, and their son died with her. And as he was going through her papers, Paul discovered that she'd been carrying on an affair with his closest friend. Oh. He was laid low with grief. Just like his mother, right? His mother who has time for all these other men, but not for me. And now his wife did the same thing to him. This guy has been rejected and abandoned by the women in his life. And boy, that had to have affected him. But he was convinced to marry again for the sake of the state. His new wife was perfect for him. She supported him, eased his anxiety. Together they toured Europe, where for the first time he was fated and treated like a ruling mm. member of some great state. And in these few months, you can see this possibility, this glimmer of hope in the letters the rulers of Europe wrote to one another upon meeting this young man, that he might be something more than his father. Was he perfect? Well, no, but they all remark on him being capable, intelligent, and, when his wife was at his side, able to let go of the anxiety and the paranoia that plagued him. But when he returned from Europe and asked to be part of the cabinet, Catherine again dismissed him, telling him that his trip had made him put on airs. So he gets built up, built up, built up by all these other people. He comes home looking for that validation from mom, and boom, door shut in his face again. Mm. He asked to fight in the army, and she said no. On every front, she still kept him from having any of the responsibility of state. And no thought whatsoever to what happens after she's gone. No thought to the long-term stability of, of the kingdom, of the empire. Uh, boy, this, this is a major failing on Catherine's part. So he sank back down into his anxiety and his paranoia. And as he grew older, rumors abounded that Catherine was going to disinherit him for one of his own sons. Now, whether she actually did or not is one of those historical questions that we'll never really have an answer. Some say that she left instructions in her will to pass the empire to her grandson, but that Paul had had that will destroyed before anyone could discover it. Others say that she died before she made up her mind on the issue. But Catherine, forgetting some of the pains of her own childhood, let her insecurities prevent her from giving her son the training or the care that he needed to rule. In the end, his paranoia became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and yep. he would be assassinated not long into his reign. And the last days for Catherine saw other steps backward as well. The Pugachev Rebellion had convinced her to step back from granting rights to the serfs, something that she had considered doing in her younger days. And now the French Revolution made her doubt all of the Enlightenment mm. ideas that she had so loved, and that in some ways had helped her carry her country so far. Because in France is where a lot of the Enlightenment is really flourished, and now they see what happens when they go extreme, and, and the terror is happening, and, and tens of thousands of people are being killed uh, just because they say the wrong thing, or they believe the wrong thing, or just because somebody else doesn't like them and wants them taken care of. And yeah, I can see how, boy, at the end of her life, just things are falling apart. 
She banned private printing presses Ooh. and made all works be approved by a censorship office. She even stopped the circulation of books by some of the very men she had corresponded with in her youth. Paranoia and at work. so, in the end, on the 17th of November, 1796, Catherine died of a stroke, leaving behind her a Russia that was larger, stronger, and more developed than ever before. She had championed health, maternal rights, and education. She had expanded the country on every border, from Poland to Georgia to Alaska. She patronized the arts, built great palaces and wonders like the Hermitage. Hmm. Under her, the army had gone from a second-rate power scoffed at in the halls of Europe to something feared the world round. She issued the first Russian banknote and brought the Enlightenment to Russia. And though she began to step back from that Enlightenment and left Russia with a dynasty incapable of completing her legacy, it cannot be said that she was anything but the Great. And if you think about it, 1796 she dies. It seems like there's a huge gap between Catherine the Great's time and the Russian Revolution, but we're talking about, what, 120 years? I mean, that's it. 120 years to when her descendant, Nicholas II, is going to be overthrown. Um, so it's really not that long. I mean, the distance between Catherine the Great's reign and the end of Nicholas II's reign, uh, when the re revolution happens, it is the same distance between today and the Wright brothers. Today and Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I mean, that's really not that long when you think about it that way. Um, so, uh, interesting stuff. Really enjoyed that series. Hope you did as well. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll put up a vote today over on Patreon about what you'd like to see next. I've got a few ideas on that, but tomorrow will be Gettysburg, and then we'll go from there. Thanks for watching.